Freedom HealthWorks is the direct primary care accelerator. We help doctors across the country start fresh in direct primary care. With Freedom HealthWorks, you work with a team, not a checklist. Visit freedomhealthworks.com and together we can achieve true freedom in direct care. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Healthcare Americana. I am your host, Christopher Habig, CEO and co-founder of Freedom Health Works. Today, we are discussing pharmacy benefit managers. We're going to go over exactly what those three words mean, or in short, we like to call them PBMs just for brevity's sake. But there's a lot of confusion out there, and it is a very complex subject. Um, PBMs can be your friend, or they can drive up costs and create a significant uh, lack of transparency or opaqueness in the healthcare benefits world. So to help guide us through this discussion, to help educate exactly what PBMs are and what they do, we're talking to Greg Greenlee, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Veris Rx. Greg, thanks for coming on Healthcare Americana and chatting with us today. Christopher, thanks for having me on your show today. The big burning question, and uh, throughout your work as a pharmacist, uh, going, uh, moving up through the ranks and now uh, helping to lead Veris Rx in the PBM world is the biggest, brightest burning question is what in the world is a pharma pharmaceutical pharmacy benefit manager? Excuse me. I'm just going to stick with PBMs for now on. Yeah, there okay, you go. That's easier. What in the world is a PBM? What do they do? How do they get paid? And where do they add value? Uh, for delivering de delivering great healthcare options to patients? That's a great question and a good way to start. So basically, a PBM is nothing more than a middleman between pharmacy providers, employers, em uh, pharmacy manufacturers, and, and the members. So what a PBM really does, they contract with pharmacy providers to provide services to their clients, their clients being... Uh, self-insured employer groups, maybe fully insured employer groups, uh, and they would manage the pharmacy benefit part of the medical benefits that the employer would provide. Uh, we manage formularies. These are list of drugs that uh, would be the best choice in a particular given uh, disease category for use. Uh, we divide those formularies up into preferred drugs and non-preferred drugs, uh, and that has is tied into the rebates from the manufacturers that are available. Uh, we manage uh, coordination of care through uh, utilization management, making sure that the drugs that are being prescribed are appropriate for that particular individual for the diagnosis and the indication, especially around the um, uh, specialty pharmaceuticals. It's very important that uh, those drugs are very high in cost, so we wanna make sure that they're appropriately utilized. Uh, so we do all those types of utilization management programs. Uh, we help drive towards the lowest net cost products by using generics uh, and preferred brands. And when uh, we have to use the non-preferred brand, then certainly we have uh, that ability. So basically, we just are connectors between the pharmacy providers, the members, and the uh, plan sponsor. Now, obviously, a lot of questions come out of that because that's a lot of complexity that you just mentioned there. And, and you did it very quickly and very succinctly, which I congratulate you. But um, so you work within employer plans, correct? That's correct. Okay. So your customer is large companies or is it mostly self pay, um, uh, self funded type self -funded, of plans? Yeah, self, self funded uh, uh, employer groups. Uh, they range in size. Gosh, we even go down to uh, under a level funded program down to five employees, all the way up to larger employer groups, 20, 30,000 lives. So uh, it's the, the whole gamut, really. So why is, so if we put in a plan for our employees or, you know, someone's listening and says, well, my employer has this plan. Why is a PBM necessary to building out that type of a plan? Sure. So the problem uh, that would arise if you tried to do this on your own, there are 65,000 plus pharmacies across the United States. So it would not be very efficient for an employer to try and have a contract with all 65,000 pharmacies. Now, obviously, if you're just a local employer, 
Uh, you might have 10 or 15 pharmacies in your town. Uh, that makes it a little more manageable, but if you don't really know under, understand how pharmacy contracting works, then you're at risk of making a bad deal for yourself and for your employees. Um, that's one of the functions that a PBM will do. We manage those contracts with the pharmacy providers. Um, we, we more or less purchase from the pharmacies one rate. And then if you're in a, under a traditional model, you would sell to the client at a different rate. Uh, the difference there then the Delta is the profit margin that the PBM would make. Um, I am a true believer in what we call a pass-through model where the contract rate that we have with the pharmacy is exactly what we give to the employer. Uh, there's no spread, everything's on top of the table, very visible. Uh, the only way I make money then is a set fee that I negotiate with the employer group and it's on top of the table. Uh, they know exactly how much money I'm going to make on a per claim or per employee basis. It's very visible. And that's a, the difference between traditional PBMs and a PBM that is more transparent or pass through. Obviously, we are big fans of transparency uh, here in Freedom HealthWorks and uh, on Healthcare Americana. If everybody knows the price, drives competition, competition is healthy, and ultimately it's okay to make money, right? It's okay to make a profit Absolutely. as long as all the cards are on the table and people are like, oh, okay, yeah, this is great. Or you're providing a superior, a superior service. So going back into uh, kind of flushing out exactly what the operational um, kind of machinations of PBMs are. And I just want to make sure I understand this co correctly. Um, again, you know, I just act like I'm a fifth grader or probably even worse on this subject and, and just kind of break it down for me. So when, uh, if I'm a company and I call up Veris and say, hey, I want to use you guys as PBMs, you already have existing arrangements with national pharmacies, local pharmacies to provide a whole litany of pharmaceutical options just in case my employees need them. Am I reading you right there? Absolutely correct. Uh, we will work with the employer to design the, the benefit plan, uh, the copay structure, what drugs they want to cover, what drugs they want to exclude, uh, what types of utilization management do they want to put in place, whether it's step therapy, quantity limits, prior authorizations, any type of cost containment features that we offer through clinical programs. We will work with the employer to explain all those and what it means if you select that, what it means if you don't select those type of options. Uh, we lay all that and then we will build the plan according to each specific client's needs. Um, at that point then, when we go live with a the client, then a member would go to a pharmacy with a prescription. Uh, the pharmacy would submit that claim to our computer system, we would adjudicate the claim appropriately and then co it uh, kicks back the, the claim to the pharmacy and the pharmacy collects $5 from Mrs. Jones for her prescription. We manage all that piece and then we will bill the client for the balance that they owe after the member's copay and we do that twice a month um, and with uh, full details on what the claims were uh, and how much they owe. What are you seeing as far as cost drivers when it comes to pharmaceuticals? Wow. Yeah, Is without a just... doubt. Yeah, go ahead. Without a doubt, the, the cost drivers today are specialty pharmaceuticals. These are incredible uh, medicines that um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago really didn't exist to the extent that they are now. Uh, they help mitigate or cure diseases. Uh, but they're very expensive. On average, they're around $1,800 a month for about a 30-day supply. Uh, they're usually, uh, uh, like I said, they're very high cost. Uh, they sometimes require special handling and knowledge uh, to um, prescribe those things to treat uh, certain disease categories, specific diseases. Uh, so those are the cost drivers today. They represent probably 1% of your total claims volume but uh, we estimate that by 2024, it'll be 50% of your total drug cost. So um, definitely something that you need to manage. Uh, if you haven't um, had a specialty claim come to your, your employer group, you're, you've been very lucky. Um, most plans will experience at least one of those per 
per year. Uh, if you're a smaller group, uh, you know, uh, that one uh, $50,000 specialty drug might break you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're a larger employer group, you might be able to handle that without any problem. Uh, there's a couple of drugs out there that a uh, million dollars a year. How, how does a small plan pay for something like that? So wow. it's uh, very important to have mechanisms in place to help control costs and make sure that it's appropriately being prescribed and used. Uh, so we, we put all those type of programs together to help manage the benefit for those employer groups. Now you got me thinking, cause you mentioned the high cost there. Is there any validity in a lot of these arguments you hear about the cost of those specialty drugs being almost exponentially higher in the United States as compared to the same stuff overseas or across the borders? Yeah, that's a true statement. Um, you know, we one of the solutions that we have for those high cost specialty drugs is international importation for members. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing the difference in cost between what you can purchase those products internationally versus here in the US, sometimes as much as 40% difference. Um, it's the old, uh, you know, capitalism is, is king, uh, you get what you can, and those that can pay will pay. And that's kind of where we're at. Um, research and development is very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, without those manufacturers um, doing the, the work to come up with these new drugs that will help cure diseases, then we would be in a really bad situation. But there's a cost to that. And it looks like uh, the people in the United States help bear the bulk of that cost. Sure, sure. And that's what always kind of boggles my mind when I hear that thinking, well, it, it is very, very expensive to go through the drug development pipeline and get the FDA clearance and approval and multi years, multi billion dollars. But then selling to international markets versus domestic markets, that much of a uh, gap, you just don't see it very often, you know, in economics, you talk about the Big Mac index and measuring the price of Big Macs across the world to, to measure currency and, and different types of inflation, deflation, deflation, that kind of thing. But then sure. you look at pharmaceutical drugs, you're like, well, this is the same, same darn stuff, yet you said a 40% discount. I mean, are we getting fleeced in the U.S. Uh, for, on a consumer level from pharmaceutical companies in this type of arrangement? Certainly, that's, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the other thing is that you know, a lot of the uh, foreign governments have price controls on their products, and uh, so they, they manage the cost that way. Uh, here in the US, 50% of the, uh, the drug spend is in government programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and those have very deep discounts. Well, somebody has to pay for that, right? And that's the rest of the, of the, the population, the other 50% that's in self-funded or fully insured businesses that um, have to pay for those, uh, those other costs. So that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're faced with. Gotcha. Um, going back to, you know, what makes your group, Veris RX, different? You mentioned, you know, transparency. Tell us a little bit more about that and how that compares to, you know, a typical PBM that, I mean, goodness, we saw a flurry of activity in, in the uh, mergers and acquisition realm from PBMs the past few years. High dollar uh, values being attached to these things and being purchased by different types of uh, health insurance plans or different, you know, national pharmacies, where, what makes you different than the kind of black hole and kind of abyss of complexity and confusion that you see from some of those major national chains? Sure. So I guess the biggest thing that I can say that makes us different is that we believe in full transparency. So let, let me put it to you in this, in these terms. So if you go to a big box store and buy a tube of toothpaste, um, you know what the price is. You know what you have to pay. You don't know necessarily what that big box retailer paid for it, mm -hmm. but you can compare that price at one big box retailer versus another big box retailer and make your, your decision on where you should buy based on that price. That's very visible. In, in the PBM world, you don't have those choices. Uh, you go from one pharmacy to a different pharmacy, but the amount that you pay would be the same, $5 or $10, whatever your copay is. The difference then would be what your employer pays. So again, you don't have much choice where your members go, although you can help steer people towards the lower cost provider that you should be able to get some of that information from your PBM if they're doing a good job. 
uh, you can develop limited networks uh, that steers towards lower cost providers. Um, you can put different copays for the higher cost providers. Uh, those are some of the, the tools that you can use. When you're in a pass-through model, then whatever I have contracted with that pharmacy provider, let's say that uh, it's, a, it's the average wholesale price minus 18%, um, that's what I would sell to the client. So the client can buy at the same price that I have contracted with that pharmacy provider. In the old traditional models, it's a little different situation. I contract with a pharmacy provider at say AWP minus 18%, but I sell to the client at AWP minus 15%. I've created a 3% spread. That 3% on a $300 drug is not a bad income on a per claim basis. The problem is the client has no idea how much money I just made on that prescription. On generic drugs, it's even deeper than that. It's not uncommon uh, for a traditional pharmacy benefit manager to make upwards of 12 to 15 to $18 per claim. If you own your own mail order facility and your own specialty pharmacy, those numbers go up even higher than that. So when I come to you as a pass through PBM and I say, hey, I want $5 per claim to handle all these transactions and do the management. Um, that's a pretty good bargain if you compare a $5 per claim to something that you have no idea, when in reality it's you know above 10 bucks, maybe above 15 bucks. But you don't know that because you don't have visibility into those type of situations. So being fully transparent and pass through Clients know exactly how much you're making on a per claim basis. Um, they, it's predictable. Uh, there's nothing that's left uh, underneath the table. Uh, so it's very open and very honest way of doing business. You mentioned before that there are a lot of pharmacies who fill prescriptions at a loss coming off of these PBM plans and something like that. Again, I know I use this before, but I kind of sit there and scratch my head and say, what? Why, why would why would they do that? Why would the retail pharmacies fill these scripts at a loss on behalf of the plans that they're contracted with? It's not by choice, uh, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes these pharmacies uh, enter in contracts that are very, uh, very difficult to understand and you don't really understand what uh, some of the terms mean. Uh, in a lot of instances, there are people that do the third party contracting for the pharmacies and the pharmacies never really see the contracts to begin with. And so they get uh, kind of uh, put in a situation where they have to participate at those rates and reimbursement uh, targets uh, in order to get business into their stores. Now, if you're a, um, a chain pharmacy or a big box retailer where you have other things to sell, then you can make up for some of those losses that way. If you're a small independent that relies strictly on dispensing uh, purposes only, then you're, you're really in trouble if you've got a very aggressive uh, reimbursement schedule where you know, you're losing 10 to 15 to $30 per script while the PBM is making 40 to $80 per prescription. It just seems wow. like you, there's a, a big uh, imbalance there. It's that big of a spread, huh? It can be, yeah. We've seen that. Uh, we've seen some that are even more than that. I, I saw one claim that uh, $225 spread that the PBM made and the pharmacy was losing $15 a spread. That's an unbelievable amount of margin. I mean, why, is, do, yeah. why do employers plans, hell, even regulators, I mean, how's that night price gouging? Why, why does anybody stand for that? Trying to figure it out, that's the problem. Uh, it's not very <laughs> visible. You have to really get into the weeds. Uh, most, most employers, they sign a contract with the PBMs and they really don't understand it. Uh, the PBMs are very good at uh, disguising what they do. And unless you check under the hood on a routine basis, they get away with that. Now, there's been some legislation that's been occurring in some of the states that will help uh, uh, curtail some of those practices. Um, but the, the PBMs have a very strong lobby. Um, and they're, they're very effective at uh, getting those type of things thrown out or uh, watered down to the point where they're basically uh, don't do a lot of good. 
Yeah, because it, I mean, that's so interesting because now you got my wheels turning, obviously, like we know what you would. And, you know, you made mention of a, of a uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling, um, you know, Rutledge versus Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. Uh, what exactly did that do on the, for those community pharmacies like you were talking about? It has to do with the abusive uh, payment uh, processes where they were forcing pharmacies to accept reimbursement below their cost. Um, and the states wanted to regulate those type of uh, situations. Um, and PCMA fought that very strongly. Uh, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sided with uh, the state that uh, the states had the authority to regulate PBM uh, actions. And uh, so that was uh, really a uh, landmark decision uh, for the state of Arkansas and a lot of other states are adopting those same types of, of uh, laws. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what the final outcome will be um, and how the PBM lobby will try to water down that regulation. Uh, obviously, they claim that ERISA would supersede state law, uh, but the Supreme Court felt differently than that. Yeah, the bringing up ERISA, which, you know, fiduciary duties, that doesn't seem to make sense on that one, but I am not a legal scholar by any means. Um, Greg, we're going to take a quick minute. We're going to pause and hear back from some of our wonderful sponsors. And then after the break, want to dive into rebates and why, you know, the ph pharmaceutical companies uh, allow this type of stuff to happen because they're being made to kind of be the boogeyman for astronomically priced pharmaceuticals. So stay tuned. Here's a message from our sponsors. All right, everybody, welcome back to Healthcare Americana. I am your host, Christopher Habig. We're talking with Greg Greenlee um, about pharmaceutical benefit managers. And if there's any takeaway from the beginning half of the episode there before our break, it's a PBMs, uh, there's a lot of room to shine the light, I guess I would say. And uh, with VerisRx, Greg, your company, it sounds like you guys are doing that and putting a lot of transparency out there. Wanted to get your take on, you know, I know this is going to be a favorite subject of yours, but PBM and pharmaceutical rebates, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> well, they're um, basically payment. You, in order to get a rebate, you have to spend money. So that's the problem with rebates. And quite honestly, I wish rebates would go completely away. We would see uh, the cost of those drugs come down considerably. But rebates are payments back to the PBM and hopefully back to the plan sponsor for using products that are on the formulary that actually pay a rebate. Um, there are, some people call them purchase discounts uh, but basically their, their enticements to put their drug on a formulary in a preferred status. Um, so they're, they're monies that are used to offset some of the cost. The problem with a lot of the traditional PBMs is that they don't share those rebates back with the client, the one that uh, their members are using those products for, or they are only sharing a portion of those rebates back. Therefore, we're, we're seeing increased cost. Um, with the rebates, obviously, the manufacturers don't give money away for free. Basically, they're raising their cost of those products in order to cover the rebate payment. We see the same thing in some of the uh, manufacturer coupon, uh, coupon copay cards that are out there. Uh, they're raising their, their ingredient cost price to cover those, those payments to help offset the, the members' copay cards. So it's just a, uh, a mean to get their product uh, utilized uh, more, more appropriately, uh, get more market share, if you will. Uh, it's just payments that uh, will help drive that piece of business. Uh, so <laughs> again, I'm, I'm sitting there kind of shaking my head, trying to wrap everything around this. And just the, like you said, the different layers are, uh, of this onion that we're trying to peel here. So for instance, if there's a hundred dollar, just to use round numbers, my employee goes to the pharmacy, pays, buys a hundred dollar prescription 
that has rebates. What are typical rebates in a scenario like that? And then who gets a cut of it? Just boil it down for us, very basic. Sure. Well, when we really get into, and this is going to get into the weeds just a little bit, sure. but rebates are only paid for brand drugs. And not every brand drug has a rebate attached to it. In fact, only about six to 10% of brand drugs actually have a rebate that is payable. Um, so when you look at that, not every drug will pay a rebate, but those that do pay rebates, they're pretty significant. It could be anywhere 25 to 30% of the wholesale acquisition cost. Um, so that is, that's a pretty big number. So let's say that on that $100 drug, you get a, uh, a $20 rebate. What happens is the PBM may or may not share that $20 back to the client. They might keep 80% of it. They might keep 50% of it. They might keep 100% of it. That's in a traditional model. In a fully pass-through model, like what Virus uses, we give 100% of that rebate back to the client. So that $20 rebate would go back to the client, making their net cost then $80 and not the $100, not counting the member's copay amount. That is a significant amount of money. Holy cow. So, <laughs> yeah, Greg, sorry, I... I I, I tend to kind of laugh and I'm kind of tongue tied here and speechless of learning something new here and saying, why in the world does this make sense? How does this make sense to somebody? Great question. Um, you know, again, going back to the big PBMs, they have shareholders and they have to return a profit in order to stay in business. And the only way they can do that is by increasing their revenues. They either do it through spread pricing or retention of rebates, uh, other programs that they would um, put in place. So yeah, it's, it's um, a lot of money involved in the PBM world. Yeah, yeah, and, and kudos to you guys for actually following through and sending that rebate back to your clients there. What would happen if rebates were no longer a thing? I have to believe that the drug costs would go down significantly because you're not paying, you don't have to cover the rebate that you're going to pay out. Uh, you're not paying for the manufacturer coupon uh, copay cards. Uh, you're not paying for the monies that those manufacturers give towards charitable organizations to help cover a cost for people that can't afford the medicines. Um, that's an important piece, uh, certainly with the cost of these drugs. Um, a lot of people cannot afford those, those monthly payments. Uh, so having something that would help those members get those drugs is an important. But, uh, you know, if, if manufacturers are raising their cost in order to cover that, then maybe there's a better solution out there. Yeah, it would seem like it. Um, basic economic theory. But I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have designed it this way. And there's a lot of people who being very, who become very, very comfortable working within this. And sure. it just feels like the wool has been pulled over our eyes in the pharmaceutical world for so long, not to mention in the benefits world, there's so much money being passed through exchanging hands that it's really hard to keep track of every single dollar and cent that goes through it. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm picking on PBMs here about being greedy, but there's other people out there that have their hands out as well. And I might get in trouble saying this, but uh, there are brokers and consultants out there that are also getting a piece of that pie, either through um, payments from the PBMs, a portion of the rebate share, a per claim fee. Uh, you know, everybody's wanting PBMs to be transparent. Well, other people need to be transparent as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So be careful about who you're pointing fingers at because uh, uh, the, those could be turned back on you as well. Yeah, I'm one of those people that's like, you know, if you can't put your prices on your website, then uh, there's probably somebody who's going to do it. And that might be a better way of doing something. Uh, sure. Just just show well, light you know, everywhere, and then let let the American consumer. Uh, we keep saying this, you know, they're very good at shopping and spending money. Uh, people the, need to be paid for the value they bring, obviously. But uh, if you're just uh, getting paid for referring a piece of business, I don't know that that's a lot of value. Yeah, I, I tend to agree there. Certainly not 20, 30 percent of any type of. Uh, transaction gosh 
I, I don't know, Greg, maybe I'm in the wrong business, but uh, <laughs> that's certainly not something that uh, those kind of margins are not something we're familiar with. And, um, you know, again, we're, we're sticklers on being transparent and showing everybody exactly what's going on and what the price is going to be and what to expect. And uh, I, I tend to believe that you'll get rewarded for that type of um, that, that way of just doing business. So, you know, I, I, as we come to the close of our, of our time together here, I want you to kind of look into your crystal ball and, and kind of put on your, your chief of U.S. healthcare hat and say, you know, Greg, what does this look like? How do we, how do we rearrange what we have right now? And, and I'm not going to go out and say it's a broken healthcare system because, you know, we have some of the best doctors and nurses and care facilities and technology and, and pharmaceutical um, research that ever existed in the world or in history, but there's a massive disconnect and kind of this big empty, you know, again, to use the word abyss in the middle of it that connects all these things. How do we get to a point and what should we do so that things in the healthcare industry are running um, more efficient and more transparent for everybody involved? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I think first of all, it's important to recognize that the that healthcare in the United States is, has tremendous opportunity for improvement, both from a clinical and an economic standpoint. Um, we're a very culturally diverse nation. Uh, we're geographically expansive, and uh, we have a lot of different options in healthcare. Um, well, you know, if if you look at us compared to other countries you'll see that those other countries may have a lower per capita uh, cost, but they all benefit from the innovations that are developed here in the United States. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, you can certainly point to obvious problems such as bureaucracy, uh, price gouging, um, perverse incentives. Um, those all come in to play, but, you know, I think the biggest problem is that too much money is being extracted from the, from the system either by individuals or, or entities without producing much value. Um, so I think that's, that's part of the situation. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, again, we have some of the, the best healthcare in the world. And I believe that, that problems arise really not in the quality of care, but the cost of care. Uh, and we're gonna continue to see these issues that are out there until we change our minds or change our mindset uh, and how we are practicing healthcare in the United States. Uh, so those are the, the things that I see that, uh, you know, we could probably do better. Um, and, I know that it, and, and uh, just interject there, I, I know you made mention before of educating the consumer too. So whether that is somebody in a plan as an employee uh, with an employer sponsored plan, but uh, I know you that, um, your team there at Veris are, are very big on educating the consumer and giving them options and then helping them choose the best option financially and, you know, for their own health too. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Greg, that's going to come to a draw to an end our time here together on this episode. So once again, that's Greg Greenlee, Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer with Veris Rx. Greg, uh, one last question for you. If anybody wants to kind of check out your company and say, you know, I'm tired of dealing with PBMs or I don't even know what mine is, uh, what's a good way to start researching what you guys are doing? Certainly, I would uh, suggest that you visit our website at www.verus-rx.com or drop me an email. Uh, you can reach me at gGreenly. that's G. G R E E N L E E at Verus, V E R U S dash R X dot com. Be happy to uh, have a conversation with you, talk to you uh, about what we do, some things that are going on in, in the industry. Uh, my, uh, my goal is to help educate uh, and we'll provide you honest answers to your questions. There you go. Once again, Greg Greenlee bringing transparency to pharmacy benefit management world, uh, something that is very sorely and very, very badly needed to help make uh, the right type of care affordable for everybody out there and all Americans. So Greg, once again, thanks for joining us here. That's gonna do it for this episode of Healthcare Americana. Once Hi again, again, everyone, this is Chris. 
At Healthcare Americana, we're always on the lookout for great stories to tell in the healthcare industry. And we'd like to hear yours. Check out healthcareamericana.com and send us your ideas for episodes or if you'd like to be a guest. Thanks again for listening. Hope you enjoy it.